Welcome everyone to the annual Brewster debate of this term. Um, it's a pleasure to be chairing. I'm George Richmond and I'm the co-president of the Fitzwilliam College Debating Society and I, alongside Sean Shirley-Smith, who is helping tonight do the sort of backroom stuff with Zoom and uh, try and make sure everything runs fairly smoothly um, as it can on these virtual forms. Um, I'm, if you can all vote, please do. Uh, tonight, unlike usual debates, I usually ask for reactions, but if you can all just go to the poll um, and I will end that once I've finished um, my sort of spiel, uh, then that would be great and I will announce the results towards the end. So tonight's debate is obviously brought to you by Fitzwilliam College and Fitzwilliam College Debate and Society alongside the Fitzwilliam College uh, Tr uh, Society Trust. So uh, they are providing the Brewster Prize. Uh, as the sort of president of the Fitzwilliam College Debate and Society, I'm very happy to be running this uh, debate and we've had a very good year this year. Uh, we've seen, we've had a new YouTube channel opened. Uh, we've also had three guest speakers attend alongside the esteemed judging panel we have tonight. We've also passed our first new constitution and I can announce tonight that we have a new president who will be taken over from me next year. Um, it's a first year student, Natasha Huang, who will be taken over at the end of this term. So we're very pleased to have elected her um, as the first elected president of the Fitzwilliam College Debate and Society. Um, of course, I, have, I need to introduce uh, the great and esteemed judges that we have with us tonight. Our lead judge tonight is Baroness Sally Morgan. Of course, I don't really need to introduce her um, as master of, the, of Fitzwilliam College, uh, but she's also the British Labour Party member uh, or a British Party La Labour Party member of the House of Lords. She was also the Minister for Women in the Cabinet Office and has been the former chair of Ofsted and a former key advisor to Prime Minister Tony Blair. She's also been a teacher and been heavily involved in the National Union of Students previously. Also with us tonight, a notable alumni of Fitzwilliam College, Sir Vince Cable. He was the former Liberal Democrat leader of 2017 to 2019 he was the Secretary of State for Business, Innovation and Skills between 2010 and 2015 uh, within the Liberal Democrat and Conservative Coalition. And some of his notable achievements include the world's first ever green investment bank, support for young people through apprenticeships and the promotion of socially responsible capitalism. I'm also told he was the president of the Cambridge Union before, uh, just after, I believe, Norman Lamont. Um, slight competitive uh, with us as a, as a debate in society, though we are slightly uh, or somewhat smaller. Also with us tonight is another notable uh, or, or key uh, alumni of Fitzwilliam College, Richard Benwell. Richard Benwell is Chief Executive of the Wildlife and Countryside Link, the largest environmental coalition in the country with 54 environmental charities and organisations represented by it. Previously, he's been the policy advisor to Michael Gove as Secretary of State at DEFRA, He's led policy and advocacy at the Wildlife and Wetlands Trust and the RSPB and served as the director of West Mill Solar Cooperative and a clerk in the House of Commons Commission. I'm also told he, at, uh, as a student at Fitzwilliam College, has previous experience of Brewster debates. Uh, according to Richard, he was utterly destroyed in his first Brewster debate, uh, but went on to win two other Brewster debates, uh, which actually is a similar experience to mine, but I didn't win two, I've only won one. Um, but I also, uh, alongside this great judging panel, and thank you all for uh, coming tonight and to being our judges. Uh, also tonight, of course, there are, the need for our judges is of course, we have two hundred pound prizes for our debate speakers. And this prize has been generously donated from the Fitzwilliam Society Trust uh, and is named after Les, Les de Brewster, who was born in 1927 in New Zealand. He read law at Auckland University and then worked his passage to the UK as a ship steward. He matriculated at Fitzwilliam House in 1948 and read history. He went on to Wy Wycliffe Hall, Oxford for theological training and was ordained at Rochester in 1953. He was for many years an Anglican chaplain and he was the founding director of the Fitzwilliam Society Trust Limited in 1974, having been president of the society in 1972-3 and he died on the 21st of March 1996. He was a benefactor of the college and the Fitzwilliam Society Trust. Well, with those uh, introductions and announcements uh, done, thank you everyone who's voted in the poll. Hopefully you've all voted. If you haven't 
yet. You've still got a little chance, um, just so I can go through quickly the structure of the debate. Uh, essentially, of course, um, after the poll and after I've announced the results, we'll have the first proposition speaker, we'll have the first opposition speaker, and then we'll have the second proposition speaker and the second opposition speaker. And then finally, we'll have the third uh, proposition and third opposition speaker. There will be no questions in, be uh, in between judges um, this time, just because, of course, we have quite a lot to get through. There are six speakers, um, each who will have eight minutes max. They will be muted at eight minutes. Um, that is a warning. We have had in the past to mute. That's one of the joys of Zoom. Um, and uh, uh, we will also, uh, in this session, we will not be having points of information. I know that makes debates sometimes lively, but because we're on Zoom, it just makes it so much easier if we don't do that. Uh, so apologies for breaking those sort of conventions. Um, so that's generally the structure of the debate. We will then have a floor, speak, uh, floor debate, uh, which everyone's welcome to contribute to. If you just have a question to speakers, message me privately or on the group chat. Uh, please state who you'd like the question to go to, so I know who to ask, otherwise it just gets messy. Um, also, if you'd like to give a statement or a speech um, for two minutes max, you will be muted after two minutes, um, then please message me and then I can select you and you can unmute yourself, turn your camera on and give a, a speech. Um, so everyone's open or welcome to do that, um, particularly as uh, there's a £20 prize for the best floor speech. So do message me privately if you want to um, enter that at the end in the floor debate. Okay, well, since we've... Uh, got all the formalities out of the way. I can announce, I'm going to end the poll now. I can announce that in the mo with the motion, this house believes the pandemic has demonstrated the positive role of state intervention. Those in favor are 24, those against 15, and those who abstained eight. So we now move to our debate. And to start our debate, the I call upon the first proposition speaker, Laura. Okay. <laughs> uh, two seconds. Okay, so um, COVID-19 has been a tragic and sobering reminder that Margaret Thatcher was wrong. There is such thing as a society, and during a crisis, the survival of our society depends upon the support provided by state intervention. The individual looking out for themselves is not enough in the face of a global pandemic, nor has it ever been enough in normal, precedented times. A single individual cannot nurse themselves. They need the state to provide a reliable system of care, the National Health Service. A single individual cannot rely on their own resolve to shield from a pandemic that affects the society as a whole. They need the state to provide a reliable system that is capable of delivering food parcels, enforcing masks, offering testing and rolling out effective vaccination programmes. Um, a single individual cannot isolate without um, experiencing repercussions. They need the state to provide a reliable system of furlough pay and also to reinforce the national message that staying home is imperative for the greater good of the community. I believe that neoliberal narratives against the nanny state go to the heart of many failures of the global pandemic response. Um, our state's response to COVID was messy and imperfect, the response in many states was. So my argument here is certainly not that the UK government's decisions were a shining example of state intervention. My argument is that COVID has taught us why investing in long-term infrastructures of state support is absolutely crucial in securing the health and longevity of our nation's people and our economy. Um, a key lesson from our response to COVID is that state support structures should not have been slashed by austerity cuts in the last few decades. Um, instead, state support structures should have been invested in and nurtured to ensure that they could support the nation in, the mo in its moment of need. Um, our NHS, that old relic from an era of celebrated state intervention, is the thread that the UK is currently hanging by, and yet we've continually undervalued our NHS. For the past decade, the government has been quietly dismantling the infrastructure of the NHS, privatising little slices of healthcare and chopping away at its funding. A terrible consequence of this privatisation was the shortage of PPE for NHS staff. Um, we don't know how many needless deaths were caused by this, so stepping away from state-based healthcare is clearly not the way to go. And if the devastatingly high death toll of America and its privatised healthcare system is anything to go by, I think we should turn around and run as fast as we can in the opposite direction. COVID's demonstrated that the invaluable worth of sustained intervention into healthcare, and it's been a stark reminder of how the NHS kind of underpins the stability of all of our lives. Um, another invaluable provision of state intervention during the pandemic has been the fellow scheme. 
In total, over the course of the pandemic, over 11 million employees across the UK have been given furlough cash. Um, furlough has been essential in ensuring people could stay at home without fearing losing their livelihoods and workers have described it as a, gods a godsend and um, a real relief. So the public's main criticism of furlough is that it should be extended to a wider range of people. So state intervention needs to be expanded, not minimized. And even the self-employed entrepreneurs and wealthy sorry, corporations who may have once have despised interfering nanny state policies have now been insistent upon their right to claim financial support. So from that, we can't go back to stigmatizing state interventions like benefits as condescending nanny state handouts. COVID's demonstrated that the state, state should step in to help us. Otherwise, what's the point of it? And in light of this, during the recovery from COVID, we can perhaps consider the need for a more involved state. Um, I mean, looking at how the government provided accommodation for homeless people practically overnight in the pandemic, that was an amazing response of how state intervention can make a real difference to vulnerable individuals and to the community as a whole. But it did also remind us that if state support systems had been adequately set up and invested in for the past few decades, perhaps many of those people might not have fallen through the cracks of austerity policies in the first place. Um, COVID has exposed the widening gap of wealth and equality in the UK and it's exacerbated the dangers of precarity. So by in the, inadequate nutrition, weakening the immune system, cramped living conditions, meaning that cases spread like wildfire and key workers are reliant on public transport are put at risk. So what we can take from this is the hope for a future of more integrated state support. So intent upon raising people out of poverty, protecting workers and investing in public services. It's doubtful that the current government <laughs> intends upon implementing this, but the lessons of COVID will hopefully serve as a warning to those coming into power in the future that they shouldn't underestimate the need for a concrete system of state support. And um, also let's not forget that state intervention is applied on a more important personal level as well. COVID's reared the ugly head of rugged individualism with many people protesting that their right to choose not to wear a mask and to not social distance was more important than the risk to another person's life. So how do you counter such a prevalent belief in an incredibly time constrained moment other than by enforcing consequences for non-compliance with COVID measures via the state? Individualism wasn't going to protect people here. And the government's repeated message of stay home, protect the NHS, save lives, was crucial in forming a uniform public response to the virus. So the figurehead of the state is the place we expect to look to for national solidarity. Where else would we look otherwise? Maybe to conspiracy theories, I don't know. But um, don't get me wrong, the brilliant examples of people coming together to organize food banks and other charities has been so key in, COVID, in the COVID response. But um, I feel we can understand that state intervention would be preferable to having people leave their homes during a pandemic to help those who are needlessly suffering, largely as a, uh, as a result of um, a lack of state support. So I think that long term, large scale help in communities is not sustainable without stable and guaranteed infrastructure. Um, hold on a sec, just have a drink. <laughs> And that um, ultimately, in hindsight, the government should have ramped up lockdown measures and testing at a much earlier stage, but they were reluctant to be perceived as an interfering nanny state. And the horrifically high death toll in the UK has taught us the sad lesson that we need to stop stigmatizing state intervention as condescending or a sign of personal failure. Instead, we need to envision it as a possible force for good in our society in that it can provide a stable background that we can build our lives from. Um, the NHS and public services are an invaluable source of this stability. Um, so we should rediscover government as a form of solution, not a problem, and recover from COVID by investing in and nurturing our state support systems to ensure that they're better prepared for a crisis like this next time, and also to lessen the widening gap of inequality that was already unfolding during normal times. Um, that's all. <laughs> Thank you. Well done, Laura. Um, unfortunately, we can't clap in these days and times, but I will, on behalf of everyone, well done, um, I will clap. Um, well done, Laura. Thank you for that first speech. We now move straight to the first opposition speaker, which is Gabe. I know we have two Gabes, so whichever which one is going first, if you want to unmute yourself, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Hello, my name is Gabe Gentile, and I will be the first speaker of the opposition. In my speech, I'll be looking at three things. I'll introduce the general sentiment of our argument, then consider cases of government failure within the UK, and finally, how the global perspective provides a compelling argument for our points. 
Gabe will then look at the impacts of the pandemic on our constitution and the resulting lack of accountability. Dan will finally consider the case of vaccine development and the disparities between central and local governments. So onto the general sentiment, which I think covers a few points of rebuttal. First of all, I'd like to make something very clear. We recognize that the state can be a very powerful tool to tackle issues which the market fails to do so, such as providing welfare, welfare and public services and other things the proposition has already outlined. We are not Tory backbenchers here. We are not anti-lockdown, nor are we anti-furlough. For a country such as ourselves that can afford it, it is most definitely the correct course of action. And to argue otherwise would be ignorant and offensive to the lives that were saved by these measures. I can also assure you that we are not members of the proposition. Our issue is that we do not believe this statement can be justified given the dire consequences of repeatedly failed state intervention. Not that we want the role of the state to be shrunk. Immediately looking, there is not going to be a clear cut answer. So of course it will have to be an evaluation of both the positives and negatives. There is an enormous amount of evidence of the negative consequences. And we hope to show you for that reason, that as people begin to lose faith in their government, that this pandemic has demonstrated to this country and to the world, the negatives of state intervention. So onto my first point of government failure in the UK. Government failure is when governments intervene, but for some reason, new problems are created or existing market failures are deepened. By no means is this inevitable if intervention is properly managed, but this has definitely not been the case during this pandemic. We can consider the example of Eat Out to Help Out, a scheme run by our popular chancellor, Dishi Rishi, which tempted us to eat inside the restaurants with a 50% discount. Despite the oncoming risk of a second wave, it still went ahead. In terms of COVID spreading, this was devastating. A Warwick University study found that this increased the number of COVID cases by somewhere between eight to 17%. We can only guess how many deaths emerged from this. Also, the economics of it appear rather flawed. It was very short term with the same paper finding that the benefits immediately evaporated once it was lifted. And the opportunity cost was enormous at a time where government spending is crucial. This money could be far better spent on the NHS, many argue, or I don't know, even providing decent quality free school meals to our starving children. This to me hardly demonstrates the positive role, but more that misthought economic strategies came at the cost of human life. Now, you could of course say that the government is hardly expected to get it all right, which is correct. So before I get called out as Captain Hindsight, I would like to point out that the magnitude and frequency of these mistakes show clear structural issues with the way state, interve state intervention has been taken in this time period. Another example which the proposition touched upon is the government's handling of PPE contracts. And we believe this perfectly backs up our point where basically they try to use, uh, utilize the forces of the free market to get access to medical equipment. We can consider the case where Miami jeweler, Michael Sager was given 200 million pound contract to source PPE. This resulted in 21 million pounds of British taxpayer money being spent upon a single Spanish consultant to help source it. When the NHS is in desperate need of more staffing, surely fees like this to an individual are something to avoid. So what was this a one-off mistake? No, frankly, it was the opposite and the start of a path of mass negligence. The National Audit has since criticized a series of government failures when awarding 17 billion pounds to private companies to, ha to help tackle COVID. Of this, half were awarded without any competitive process and you'd be 10 times more likely to get a contract if you were referred by an MP who could well be your friend. This government has clearly not yet learned how to say no to nepotism. So when we compare this to lockdown and furlough, it is important to recognize lockdown and furlough have been successful in its initial implementation. And if we were to use the comparison of a complete free market, government intervention would of course be the best course of action. But these actions alone are not enough to demonstrate a positive overall value. The government is not free from criticism because they implemented these measures. Again, if we consider the frequency and magnitudes of mistakes that have taken place, the unnecessary deaths and misery, and misery, we really need to consider these facts. The fall in approval rating of somewhere around 12% throughout the pandemic has clearly demonstrated that people have begun to lose faith and are frustrated by these negative consequences of state intervention, which our final speaker, Dan, will continue to explore. So onto my final point of the international perspective. 
we are aware that this motion is not only confined to the UK. So what if we were the only ones to mess it up? I'm sure the opposition would be very happy to bring up the example of New Zealand. And that is something we could agree with, on you with, that New Zealand has demonstrated the potential positive impact of state intervention. There are, of course, things that countries like the UK could learn, but we have not seen this demonstrated in this pandemic. Although who knows about the next one? However, to say that we can scale up this example of New Zealand to the rest of the world is very misguided. We see it as one small, isolated and very developed country that has had the means to do so. In fact, we would go to, as far to say that this example would be offensive to the rest of the world that do not have the means, as the virus has shown no mercy on the 1.2 billion people living in informal housing conditions. In fact, this narrative has created a very damaging response of a one size fits all lockdown measure, when in fact, many countries do not have the means to afford furlough schemes and support for those living in the informal war economy, nor the means to actually enforce those lockdown rules, leading to a constriction of economic output with little to show for it in terms of disease containment. This has put families in a very difficult position. Stay in lockdown and starve or break it to feed your family. For example, if we consider El Salvador, which announced a 30 day lockdown despite having zero cases, and not long afterwards saw crowds of people storm the capital for some support, some food as they were left behind. The World Health Organization has estimated that three month lockdowns in many African countries could lead to an additional 1.4 million deaths from tuberculosis and double the death rate toll from malaria. It is clear that state intervention has failed here on an international scale. And instead we should have encouraged bespoke lockdown schemes that encompass the state's unique circumstances. So overall, we applaud lockdown and furlough steps taken in the UK, but believe that these basic and necessary measures are not enough to justify a resultant positive impact when taking into account the gross mismanagement, grievous errors and general lack of competence of this government. We are only a small part of the COVID puzzle to tell the rest of the world, the majority of the world who do not have the resources for effective support, sch support schemes that state intervention has been positive is impossible when considering the misery. For these reasons, we oppose the motion. Thank you. Well done, Gabe, and thank you for that speech. Well, we now move very swiftly to our second proposition, Bertie. Hello, everyone. I'd first like to thank our judges for coming uh, and all my fellow speakers. As a brief rebuttal, I think a lot of the points made by Gabe there condemn this particular Tory cabinet rather than the notion of state intervention itself, but that's a matter of perspective. As Laura said, crises like the COVID pandemic are awful phenomena which cause despair and chaos in our societies. But history shows us that they can also accelerate progress in public discourse and social unity. The Second World War paved the way for the nationalisation of healthcare and the creation of the NHS. Coronavirus needs to have the same effect on how we think about the state's duty to intervene and protect its citizens. Nowhere is this truer than in the case of homelessness. I'd like to begin with the story of a man named Mark. Aged 15, he left school with no qualifications, and by his 20s, he and his girlfriend, Rebecca, were addicted to heroin. One day he found Rebecca dead. Soon afterwards, his aunt, his father, and his best friend also died. Mark suffered serious mental health problems and spent his life in and out of prison for offences like theft and drug possession. About a decade ago, he was evicted from his flat and was forced onto the streets. It was his 53rd birthday in 2018, but Mark never turned 53. He died the day before, alone, on the streets of Glasgow. He was one of 45 people who died homeless in 2018, not 45 people in the country, 45 people in that one city. The course of Mark's life reflects the failures of the British state, which hasn't taken an active enough role in what should be its number one priority, improving the welfare of its citizens. We see an education system which failed to prepare that teenage boy for life afterwards, an attitude to drug use and mental health, which saw victims as a strain on society, rather than human beings in need of help. A criminal justice system of revolving doors designed not to rehabilitate offenders, but to throw them back onto the streets after ineffective sentences. And a social housing system, which has been eroded since Thatcher by privatization and deregulation. No wonder homelessness is such a problem in this country. 
Homelessness is measured in different ways. Over 280,000 people in the UK are either homeless or in need of government support to avoid becoming homeless. You could say that this number alone represents a crisis which has gone ignored by central government for years. Cuts to local authorities have meant that annual expenditure on homelessness, support and prevention dropped by 25 percent or £700 million between 2008 and 2018 as homelessness has shot up. The Chancellor's recent budget includes a continuation of the stamp duty holiday, removing the tax on the purchase of a house. While this sounds good, it's just tokenistic because it just benefits those fortunate people who are already in a position to buy in the first place and preserves the exorbitant property price prices which are the very reason so many people end up homeless. As for rough sleeping specifically, in the autumn of 2019, on any single night, approximately 4,250 people were sleeping on the streets of this country. But a year later, in the autumn of 2020, that number was 2,688, a drop of 37%. What happened? Coronavirus happened. The government was forced to spend £3.2 million in March last year to give accommodation to 15,000 people. The pandemic has shown how easy it is to save these human beings if we can just be bothered to correct the failings of our market-driven dog-eat-dog housing system. I'm throwing a lot of numbers around, so allow me to put them into context. As I said, it cost the government just £3.2 million to house 15,000 people for two months, and local authorities spend around £2 billion on homelessness each year. By the way, ask any charity and they'll tell you that's not enough. Now, an advocate of the small state, someone perhaps on the opposition, might say that it's right for the government to be fiscally frugal in social security and welfare spending and not to intervene in housing. But there's a hypocrisy at play there. When people call for state intervention to spend money on homes for human beings, there's a lot more scrutiny and stinginess than in other areas of expenditure. For example, we're going to spend £205 billion on upgrading our nuclear weapons. The pro-Brexit argument spoke of future sunlit uplands for Britain. So far, those uplands seem decidedly drizzly, and Brexit is estimated to cost in the hundreds of billions. £90 billion of taxpayers' money is spent each year in grants and subsidies to unregulated tax-dodging corporations like Amazon. All these costs far outweigh the estimated 10 billion needed to create a proper, modern social housing infrastructure to accommodate every person. Just 10 billion. But the point is that numbers shouldn't even matter. Even if it weren't financially easy to house homeless people, which it is, the state should feel a moral obligation to step in and do so anyway. We're talking about people dying in the sixth richest country in the world because they're too cold at night? It doesn't take much to fix this. These problems are not intractable. And withholding investment in society doesn't save the state money. It kicks the can down the road and causes more people to fall through the cracks of our increasingly weak social safety net, creating more costs in the long run. According to the charity crisis, people being homeless actually costs the state roughly double what it would if they were given stable, secure housing. All we need to do is wake up and smell the coffee and get our priorities right. Before I finish, I just want to say something about the myth that the non-interventionist small state brings us closer to freedom or a dynamic economy. It doesn't. We all know what the small state really looks like. It looks like a woman in the United States being denied life-saving hospital treatment because she can't show proof of insurance. It looks like people like Mark from earlier dying on the streets because of a cost-cutting, miserly approach to public services, which favours box-ticking and statistics over human lives. And it looks like a footballer having to do the work of politicians in standing up for the four million British children living in poverty, while the wealthiest in this country pay less tax on their assets than those children's parents do on their income. That doesn't sound like freedom to me. It sounds Darwinian. And if we think we have a good economy because we have a high GDP, then we need to realise who it is that serves this economy and who it is that this economy serves. Homelessness is the direct consequence of a non-interventionist economy managed in boardrooms rather than local councils, driven by profit rather than our well-being. If you agree with me that the state ought to intervene and correct this to provide strong public services and prevent more tragic cases like Mark's, then I ask you to vote for tonight's motion. Thank you.
Thank you, Bertie. Uh, that was brilliant. Thank you. OK, well, we move very swiftly again uh, to our second opposition, uh, Gabe. Thank you. So as Gabe said before, we recognise that there is a necessity of state intervention and there are positive outcomes. However, our main argument doesn't suggest that state intervention as a whole is bad. We just say that it's shown a net negative impact during the pandemic and it goes far beyond the singular issue of homelessness. I, I now want to move on to some of the constitutional issues that have arisen from state intervention during the pandemic. The issues that I will be raising all stem from one natural result of state intervention, the concentration of power in the executive branch of government. This is an inevitable result of increasing state intervention as parliamentary capacity is limited, whereas the size of the executive is seemingly limitless. In turn, this results in the bypass of Parliament, shown by the parliamentary decline thesis proposed by Lord Bryce and accepted since its conception. Parliament's declining legislative role has been allowed by Mark Elliott, the chairman of the law faculty here at Cambridge, but only on the condition that its scrutinising competency has increased to compensate. The coronavirus pandemic has shown that this hasn't happened. The government has been able to bypass Parliament and ensure that it's neither performing a legislative or a scrutinising function. Overall, the result of such extensive state intervention is, that the is the contradiction of our fundamental constitutional principles, as well as a worrying lack of executive accountability and bad law. This bypass of Parliament is shown by the government's reliance on statutory instruments. According to the Hansard Society, 379 statutory instruments relating to COVID have been passed since the 28th of January last year, of which 264 were made negative, meaning that they became law before even being put to Parliament. A further 165 of these broke the 21-day rule. This consistent bypass of Parliament has been heavily criticised by Speaker Lindsay Hoyle, who described the government's approach as wholly unsatisfactory with a total disregard for the House. Select committees failed to make up for this alarming lack of accountability as they sit retroactively and the Lord Select Committee lacks the democratic legitimacy to affect material change. The accountability bypass is very worrying constitutionally and has been caused by the magnitude of state intervention. The primary legislation that confers these powers also raises some worrying issues. There are two relevant acts, the Public Health Control of Disease Act 1984 and the Coronavirus Act 2020. Using an act from 1984 to bypass a modern parliament to intervene is democratically questionable, and Lord Sumption argues that there was no provision in the 1984 Act for the de facto detention of healthy citizens. Stretching parliamentary wording in this way without further parliamentary input seems unconstitutional. The 2020 Act is also problematic. The bill was 321 pages long, yet MPs weren't given any time to read it before it was fast-tracked through both houses with no meaningful debate. Arguments pertaining to urgency hold no weight here. Discussions over lockdown went on for months before it was implemented, whilst Johnson failed to attend COBRA meetings. The executive showed no political urgency at all, just a disregard for the parliamentary process. This is exceptionally abhorrent, given that the Act conferred so-called Henry VIII powers, allowing the government to amend and repeal primary legislation without the need for parliamentary consent. This conflicts with the widely accepted Dicean viewpoint that parliamentary sovereignty sits at the pinnacle of our constitution. Furthermore, the concentration of power in the executive that has resulted from this excess state intervention has led to the government adopting American style press conferences rather than the dispatch box for policy announcements. Whilst the press can provide publicity and some accountability through the electorate, they don't have the same mechanisms of material accountability available to parliament. For example, the £10,000 fine, a very significant and potentially life-changing criminal sanction, was not debated in Parliament, despite being announced eight days before taking effect. This has been a pattern of COVID regulations. The inclusion of proper process would not impair their purpose, but most have only been debated retroactively, if at all. There is no excuse for taking such an impactful decision without any involvement of Parliament, but the executive feels entitled to bypass Parliament because of the requirements of state intervention. Lack of accountability stemming from increased state intervention also results in bad law of two types, poor policy and poor drafting. 
Preventing bad law is the instrumental justification for proper strict process. Where the, de where the decision is made by decree with no accountability mechanisms, there is a greater risk of bad policy. For example, the decision to impose a 10 p.m. curfew was reportedly taken solely by Johnson alone on the basis of strong symbolism rather than any data-driven argument. If the PM had to justify himself to parliament, the same outcome may not have been reached. This particular restriction led to no decline of social contact or interaction and simply created a new rush hour, a result that would have been entirely foreseeable for parliament. As well as poor decisions, lack of accountability leads to errors in the drafting of law as mistakes aren't noticed. Many of the statutory instruments passed had to be error correcting rather than substantive. For example, the lengthily named Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions Northeast of England Amendment Regulations 2020, laid on the 18th of September last year, simply revoked their original regulations, which were inaccurate and caused lots of confusion. Had they been made affirmative and gone before Parliament, the mistake was more likely to have been caught, potentially by an elected representative of the affected region. Heavy state intervention also has a detrimental impact on the key rule of law principle that is legal certainty. COVID regulations have not been clear, definite or easily understood, at times creating a nation of accidental lawbreakers. No one is certain where they stand. This was often a result of contradictory regulations that could only be untangled by legal professionals, as well as regulations published at the 11th hour. An example of this is the 10 p.m. curfew that was published at 5 a.m. the day it came into force, giving effective individuals very limited time to react. Had lower levels of state intervention allowed for parliamentary involvement, this unwelcome outcome would have been mitigated as due process allows for the widespread publication of potential decisions. To sum up, state intervention has led to parliament becoming an empty vessel. In practice, it neither makes the law, authorizes the law, or scrutinizes the law. This should be considered abhorrent for a country that places parliamentary scrutiny at the pinnacle of our constitution. Without mechanisms of accountability, we've been in effect governed by decree over the last 12 months. No matter your stance on the merit of the government's actions, this level of state intervention has had an extremely negative impact on our constitution. Thank you. Well done, Gabe, thank you for that. Okay, well, we move finally to our final speakers, uh, set of speakers, and we go now, just checking, uh, we now go to Jake, who is our third proposition speaker. Yeah, okay. Um, <clears throat> so, so far the proposition, I would argue probably has won. Uh, over the course of this speech, I will sort of go over some of the good things the the prior speakers have said and also basically say why the opposition are wrong in their viewpoints um one of the main sort of aspects of the first proposition's argument was putting into the forefront of the conversation the dichotomy between neoliberal ideology which is that individuals make up society and individuals have enough autonomy to benefit each other um, in lieu of the state doing it itself. And the severity of a pandemic, which has, <clears throat> which has demonstrated uh, a, a lot of different things that the individual simply cannot control. Um, and the states who got, rid of the, who got rid of COVID from their borders very quickly did so by closing their borders. There were countless examples of it. And that is something that individuals cannot do. It is state intervention to close your borders. And every other, every other thing that states have done to intervene over the course of the pandemic ultimately have mattered less in getting rid of the pandemic than closing borders. Face masks have had a small, a small effect and that's the sort of thing that individuals can do. They can go out and buy a face mask um, and then wear it whenever they're in public. But it was also demonstrated that when the pandemic first began, most people didn't do that. I didn't do that, to be honest. It, it wasn't until it was law to wear a face mask that everybody started wearing a face mask and protecting each other. And it's because a lot of the time people just don't know the sorts of effects that those sorts of actions can have. You need to be told 
um, that a face mask is used to protect other people, because most people, I think, still think that a face mask is worn to protect yourself. Um, and the first opposition talked about how great it is for state intervention in the richest and the most developed countries. But he only used New Zealand to prove that that's the case. And so I'd like to bring up the case of Vietnam, which is a tourism heavy country. Its economy depends on tourism. Um, and when they had a single COVID case, they closed their borders, they closed schools, they instituted a lockdown. And unlike El Salvador, they gave food packages to everybody in lockdown so their capital wasn't stormed because their citizens were taken care of. And from there, they had a quick lockdown, removed COVID from their borders, and then they slowly opened their borders again and did what the UK, the UK has done, I think about two months ago. They did this about a year ago where um, everybody who was coming into the country had to quarantine and they actually did have to quarantine because the state provided accommodation for them. So they knew that they were quarantining. And one of the key things that the pandemic has shown is that these half measures that neoliberal states like to do, like the UK did by saying, oh yeah, you should quarantine, we'll fine you if, if we notice that you didn't quarantine once you came into our borders. I don't, I don't think that any fines have actually been handed out and they've never checked. Um, they simply don't work. State intervention has to be decisive and it has to be actually followed through on. And this is something that a poor tourism-based country like Vietnam did. And Vietnam was partly motivated to do so because they were scared of the impact of COVID on their poorly funded weak healthcare system. And they understood that because of their poverty, letting COVID uh, continue and play a big role within their, within their state would actually have a big impact. Whereas the richer countries had a hubris about them and said, well, we'll be fine anyway. It won't hurt our economy too much. Our economies are strong and they'll be fine. And we've seen how that has worked out for us. Um, the second opposition's points about the constitution are kind of valid if you follow that line of argument, but ultimately everything that was discussed doesn't actually consider the benefits of the UK's constitution, which is that it is actually quite malleable. And it's because it's not codified, because it's not entrenched in times of national peril, governments can do things that they wouldn't do in normal day-to-day -day life. They can have decisive action. They can intervene in a much more meaningful way. And yes, this current Tory government has done so quite poorly, but I've refused the line of argument that they did so to avoid the scrutiny within the House of Commons or Parliament in general, because, I mean, particularly in the House of Commons, the opposition hasn't opposed anything over the course of the pandemic. They voted through every single measure. It doesn't make any sense to argue that the government were trying to avoid opposition because there hasn't been much opposition, frankly. Um, and that's not me being a Tory or Labour or anything. It's just a fact if you look at how votes have gone. Um, the first opposition also identified the Eat Out to Help Out scheme. This is an example of a really good state intervention policy done at completely the wrong time. And the Eat Out to Help Out scheme has actually demonstrated how salient state intervention can be among the population. At the time, everybody was very hyped up about it and was excited about it. And the state managed to essentially control individual behavior and get people out to pubs and restaurants. Now, the problem is that they did so in the middle of a pandemic when there was still COVID within our borders. If they had waited until we got rid of COVID, we'd had a proper lockdown. Hospitality had been suffering because we'd been locked down for, uh, a, well, it would have been a few weeks if they'd done the lockdown properly and closed our borders. If, they, if, hospitality, if hospitality had taken a small hit and then we had no more COVID, and they wanted to give the hospitality sector a big boost, then the Eat Out to Help Out scheme is an amazing idea and is, would have been very effective and would be a great example of state intervention, which is a particularly key point because businesses themselves can't do that. 
businesses themselves were the ones who were suffering. And so not only has the pandemic showed things that um, showed ways in which the state needs to intervene over individuals, but also actually in business to support businesses and help them. And uh, a final point um, is the NHS is a state institution, right? And basically the only thing that the UK has actually done well is with respect to vaccines. And we're now, we now have a roadmap out of lockdown and towards the end of the pandemic because of vaccines. Um, how successful this roadmap will be, the measure is now actually on how quickly we get the vaccine rolled out. And we, we're leading in the world in terms of vaccines administered, in terms of how many vaccines we bought. And that is state intervention. That's not something that an individual can do. They can't buy a vaccine and administer it to themselves. And it's not something that private healthcare has proven very capable of doing, as shown in Okay, uh, I'll wrap up now. Um, so that's a key example of how a state, a state institution has done something that wouldn't be possible otherwise. And the first the first opposition made the point that the government has subcontracted a lot of things to outside institutions over the course of the pandemic, which has been disastrous. And the point is, is that if they had actually done it themselves and intervened as a state, then the, it would have been more effective because contracting out to other institutions isn't really state intervention. It's actually shirking the responsibility and the scrutiny for those things. Okay, I'm done. Thank you, Jake. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that, Jake, and well done uh, for your speech. Excellent. It's slightly over time, but that's fine. Um, we now move, of course, finally to our final speaker. But just before we do so, I, I thought I should mention, of course, we are coming up to our floor debate. If you'd like to speak in the floor debate, please do message me privately so that I know who to select um, to ask to turn their camera on. It doesn't have to be, if you want to be up for the £20, it doesn't have to necessarily be a speech. You can just give a question um, and it can be as short as you want. Uh, the two minutes is more of a barrier. Don't go beyond that. So um, if you do want to uh, go up for it, please do message me um, and I will then obviously point to you during the uh, floor speech. Anyway, let's move to our final speaker, Dan, for the opposition. Thank you, George. And I, I want to thank everyone who came to watch tonight. I really appreciate your interest in this debate. Um, I want to start by really redrawing our attention to the motion at hand, because you've heard from, from our opponents, they've quite eloquently defended a wide range of different points. But in my opinion, they have failed to defend this motion. They didn't even try. We are here to debate whether or not a level of state intervention is necessary in a time like this. Well, it, it probably is. And we are not here to defend whether or not state intervention is better than an entirely unregulated capitalist market economy. Again, it probably is. But the question that's before the House tonight is whether or not the pandemic has demonstrated, has shown the positive role of state intervention. And has the pandemic as an experiment, as a test case, truly been the state's great success story? I, I think the evidence very much suggests otherwise. Now, to start off, every example of a state intervention done well, be it New Zealand, be it Vietnam, I, I will happily give you Vietnam, there are many examples around the world where the state has failed to protect its citizens properly. That includes the UK, it includes the US, it includes Brazil, and it includes nearly every single European country. Um, to take a more personal example, my own government, um, in, in the Netherlands, they've been incredibly slow with setting up proper testing, gave up contact tracing and week into the first, um, first wave, slowest vaccine rollout in Europe, and most importantly, they have allowed for heartbreaking losses of so many of our nation's most vulnerable people, those in the care homes, who were locked off from their family, seeing no one but their nurses for often more than six months. And if that is not the state failing to protect its citizens, then what is? If this pandemic is to be regarded as a success for state intervention, then I would say, ladies and gentlemen, that the bar is very low indeed. So I want to um, cover two points. And, and the first of that is that the state uh, has shown to fail to take local circumstances into account. So 
our countries have a lot of internal differences, be it between the countryside and the cities, but also in England very much between the north and the south. Um, and the centralised um, bureaucratic Westminster approach has been very, very southern oriented and has failed to take these different circumstances and especially those in the north into account, as has been so eloquently pointed out by our FITS alumnus, Andy Burnham, the mayor of Greater Manchester. Um, so that is a first position where the centralised state um, just loses out on a lot of potential. A second example comes from a more positive side of this uh, pandemic, which is the development of the vaccine. Um, it is truly a remarkable achievement, although I may be somewhat biased here as a natural scientist, but in, in less than a year, we've seen the development of not one, but many highly functional, uh, effective vaccines against this disease. They haven't been developed in state laboratories. They were developed by public uh, university researchers together with private sector companies. They were driven by financial interest, by a scientific drive, and perhaps a kind of moral responsibility to do some good for the community. They've often been doing these things for decades. And, and when this pandemic started, they weren't directed by the state to start working on that. They simply did. That's true for the scientists at, at Oxford, um, at AstraZeneca, at Moderna, and all those other companies and universities. If anything, this pandemic has shown the power of innovation, of, of creativity, and a sort of ground level up, um, people doing what they're really good at and what they are um, passionate about. This isn't the top down bureaucratic state telling them what to do. This is a uh, society sorting out for itself. Now, I want to address some of the points of our opponents. Um, and I want to especially point out that they have in many ways uh, misrepresented our argument. As I said before, they are debating very different motions tonight. We never said that individuals should all sort it out for themselves. We never said that all state intervention is bad. That is not what the debate is, to, uh, um, is about tonight. It's about whether or not the pandemic has shown to be a um, success. We've, we've heard uh, the second speaker talk about the homelessness crisis, which um, hadn't been done anything about for a long time and where the state has a lot of potential to do good. But I would ask, do we really need a pandemic to show that? Do we really need the tragedy that this year has been to show that? We've known it for a long time and yet nothing has been done. We never said and we never will that the state shouldn't do anything about homelessness. It easily can and I agree that reducing the nuclear arms budget would be a very good place to start. We easily can but that is not at all what this debate is, tonight, uh, is about tonight. We are debating whether or not the pandemic has been a success for the state, whether or not it has shown that the state can do a lot of good. What I have seen is potential for the state to do a lot of good but unrealized potential. Um, I frankly believe that we can expect a bit more from the state than what we have seen over the past few years in such a developed, rich and civilised country uh, as is the UK. So, in conclusion, what can we really say from this pandemic? I would say it has shown uh, the fragility of our modern society, the importance of our social relationships and how easily it can all go away, our deeply problematic relationship with the natural world, which has been at the root of this crisis, and, and the vital role of healthcare and science in a civilized society. When it comes to the state, it has shown that lockdown, furlough, um, and national healthcare has potential to do a lot of good and to save lives. At the same time, it has shown that centralization, bureaucracy, um, cronyism, and a lack of democratic accountability also has the potential to do a lot of harm. When it comes to think about what this pandemic has really mean for the state, we cannot conclude anything more than the trivial result, the truism that state intervention is good when it is good and bad when it is bad. State intervention is a tool that can be used and should be used in a time like this. However, it has to be done well. And if it isn't, it can just as easily cause a lot of damage. And I believe that considering all the facts of the past year, that is really the only conclusion that we are allowed to draw. And I hope that is what you will all see tonight. And I urge you with that to vote for our side of the debate. Thank you. Well done, Dan. Thank you for that. OK, well, that's all the debate speeches uh, done now.
We now ask the judges if they're happy to, to move to a breakout room, which hopefully will be shortly um, put up for you guys. Um, and if you move into that, you will have 15 minutes max, but you're welcome to come back at any time uh, to rejoin us. We will probably be mid-flow uh, floor debate. So yeah, you're all welcome to join there. Otherwise, uh, the poll should be open shortly. We will launch that once we've also done the breakout room for the judges. Sean's got a lot to do in, in a short period of time. So um, let's just move straight to the floor speech on our side. I do have two speakers who have already messaged me um, to speak. Can I also make a slight plea? I noticed that obviously I do recognize that our panel is predominantly male. Um, and I also have a number of people who put themselves forward who are also male. So can I urge, please particularly, um, for female members of the audience to um, just, you know, you're welcome to just put a question forward. Uh, it doesn't have to be a long speech, but um, yeah, I do urge you to, to perhaps um, speak as well, just so we, you know, um, are not dom dominated by uh, male members of the audience or the speaking panel. Okay, well, I do call upon um, Jamie uh, Parker Ward first to make a statement. You have two minutes, Jamie, the floor is yours. The pandemic has demonstrated more than ever the failures of laissez-faire government as a response to the problems of our society. But these are lessons that we should have learned long ago. Today, society is more unequal than ever. The Gini coefficient, which is our typical way of measuring inequality in society, is much higher today than it was in the 1970s, hardly a sign of progress. Child poverty, meanwhile, has continued to grow to the extent there was a UN special report on the matter just a couple of years ago. 40 million people, the last time I checked, live in poverty in the United Kingdom. That is one in five of the population. The Institute for Fiscal Studies, meanwhile, has predicted a 7% rise in child poverty from 2015 to 2022. And this should increase now that we know that the economy will grow 3% less than it was predicted to do so if the pandemic had not occurred. The true fact is that many of these problems did not exist 40 years ago. Inequality was at a historical low, but we got afraid. Afraid of the so-called stagflation in the 70s, which helped kill the welfare state. But even these crises saw better equality than before the pandemic. In 1977, unemployment was around 2.5%. In 2013, it was 6%. All for an inflation crisis that was caused by huge oil prices, not a welfare state or social interventionism, and a recession that was nearly half the size of the 2008 crash, yet did not cause the end of neoliberalism. This is not a lesson of the pandemic. It's a lesson of history. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie, for that. Well done. Um, brilliant statement. Uh, and of course, I, I haven't mentioned that we do have the brilliant Dr. Matt Neal with us tonight, who is our uh, resident history fellow at Fitzwilliam College. Not the only one, obviously, uh, but he is with us tonight and he's judging the floor debates and statements. Um, so he'll be judging who gets the £20 prize. Uh, and in that spirit, we, of course, have another speaker, uh, Jacob. The floor is yours. You have two minutes. Thank you, Fitzbillies, for all the speeches. Uh, just a, a question I'd like to pose to everyone, really. The last speaker mentioned this idea of um, a moral obligation, and many moral philosophers like Kant have argued that there is a an intrinsic moral responsibility to help others, a, a deontological responsibility. And then in stark contrast to that, there's the the personal selfish desire to survive, the, the Darwinian aspect. And I think whatever the government may implement, uh, whether it's actually actuated, it depends on the tension between this collectivism and uh, Darwinianism. I would just like to ask uh, the speakers, do they think that the success stories of this pandemic uh, have been because uh, of a feeling of mutual responsibility others have had to their peers or because they've simply been acting in their own selfish self-interest to survive in a Darwinian manner? And then 
not to trivialise myself after that, but I, I would ask, is that a redundant question? Does it matter if um, the spread of disease has been mitigated? Does it matter whether people have acted selfishly to achieve that or whether they've acted uh, in tandem? Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Jacob. Um, I should also just mention to everyone, of course, uh, I know the majority of you are here from Fitzwilliam College. Obviously, we can only pay you if you are from Fitzwilliam College, just to make that clear that all um, members have to be from Fitzwilliam College to be up for the prizes. Um, yeah, so we obviously have a question there for the speakers. Who would like to answer it first? Jacob, uh, Jake, yeah. Yeah, I can answer it. So um, <clears throat> I think, so I, I'm a HSBS student, so this is basically my course. Um, <laughs> but I, I think actually the first floor point uh, and the question go quite well together because I, I didn't write a speech for tonight because I was writing an essay about Gandhi. And Gandhi pointed out that history is made when the status quo, the daily life um, ends, basically. It's, it's the, the general force of like general love and community is ceased for whatever minute. And then during those times, history happens. So arguably, this is the first historic moment, at least for most of the neoliberal states, um, since neoliberalism has really come to the forefront. Because in this moment, there's been mass death, there's been mass conflict, the entire country has been actually very divided. And under those strenuous situations, um, I think that there has definitely been a rise in both collectivism and Darwinism. Like, uh, like Laura mentioned in her speech, the use of community charity, uh, communities coming together to feed the vulnerable and help them shield has been intense. But at the same time, protests have happened because people don't want to wear a face mask. Um, and they have formed super spreader events for that reason. And clearly, the, like, it's not necessarily a dichotomy, but if we treat it as one for a moment, the collectivism and the mutual, the collective responsibility and the mutual respect and love for other humans has been the thing that has saved lives. And um, the, the individual minded sort of Darwinian approach has actually caused more deaths. And, you know, the protests have been super spreader events. The people who are in it for themselves in order to try and survive have helped themselves die. So I think collectivism has won out and that mutual love has won out. And um, I think it's shown to be very pragmatic over the course of the pandemic. And that is a part of state intervention because state in intervention isn't, isn't always done because it's useful, but oftentimes it's done because it's right. Okay, thank you, Jake, um, for that answer. Just a reminder to also the, the debate speakers, and I'll come to you, Dan, shortly, but just a reminder to everyone that obviously if we can keep to um, two minutes, both the ones who are asking the questions, but also those who are answering, um, just so we can keep this slot um, fairly on time. Dan. Uh, so yeah, I'm, I will also just come into that. First of all, as a natural scientist, I, I really don't like the misuse of the term Darwinian. It has nothing to do with selfishness and modern humans. There's an entirely different thing that Darwin really said nothing about, and it has nothing to do with evolution in general. So we shouldn't use that term. But when we are discussing um, sense of community versus selfishness, I think it's a struggle for everyone, really. Everyone is, is part of a community, but we also all have conflicting desires, conflicting interests. But I think overall, um, on, on, a, on a community, more small scale level, this pandemic has really shown um, that there is a lot of, of, of community in our society. We've seen, seen mutual aid on a lot of different levels in, in local communities. Um, and I think that that's a very beautiful thing, which is not really related, I would say, to the mechanism of the state, which is sort of trying to create this very large community, which is directed by a very small group of people who dictate to everyone uh, what should happen so yeah I, I would agree with you that it's it's always a conflict but not only between the selfish people and the nice people I think it's a conflict within everyone and the pandemic has shown um, that we can go to come together um, and often we should and it can do a lot of good. Thank you Dan for that yes Bertie. I just want to quickly say on the point Darwinian 
uh, obviously I use the term Darwinian metaphorically in the same way that when we say something is Kafkaesque, we don't literally mean it is from a book written by Kafka, just that it resembles some of the ideas that society has come to understand those people by, but not necessarily that that's what they intended. Thank you, Bertie. I have a question here uh, from someone who's just written in um, to both the opposition and the proposition. So be ready to put your hands up if you want to react. Um, what are the true truth conditions for the motion to be passed? Is it simply that there exists an X such that X is an example of state intervention during the pandemic and X was successful? Or is it that it was successful in the majority of cases? Or that when we encounter a government intervention during the pandemic, we should expect it to be successful. Who wants, who wants to go for that? Yeah, uh, well, Jake, you've spoken already. Do you mind if I sort of seek someone else? Laura, would you be willing to? Yeah. Uh, okay. um, I kind of feel like this question was more, uh, it was less focused on the success of state intervention. It was more on the positive role. And for me, it's demonstrated, the, the, pandem temp the pandemic has demonstrated the potential for um, the state intervention to be positive. It's not necessarily proved, you know, that governments are perfect and state intervention is always perfect and it can guarantee everything. But to me, it's it's more that you can, um, you can see the importance of its role and you can, you can take the lessons from COVID and what the state has done wrong to then build a more sustainable and better infrastructure of state support in the future and realize how important that is, not just for during crises, but during to, to prevent the stability, uh, to prevent precarity in everyday lives. Okay. Thank you, Laura. Uh, yes, Gabe. I would agree that we've seen the potential once again that state intervention can hold. And we've had a few examples of this, of what can be done if the state's resources are put to good use. However, during the pandemic period, I would not say that it's demonstrated actual positives from the intervention itself. Instead, we've rather seen a collection of what can go wrong. And again, yes, there are many lessons to learn from next time. So perhaps for the next pandemic, we would be talking, we could well say that um, the governments had demonstrated the positive role, but for this one, it has simply been the potential and nothing more. Thank you, Gabe. Um, does anyone else have any questions or want to make a statement? There is time still available. We have two minutes before we move um, on from the floor debate or speech. Um, and also, I believe all the judges are back, but we still have time if anyone has any more questions. Although it seems that we are missing Vince. Uh, so Vince, did he did he get lost in the transition? I'm, I'm slightly worried that we've we've lost uh, Sir Vince. Um, Okay, well, hopefully he will be able to rejoin. Um, oh, he's still in the breakout room. Okay, well, Sean will, I think, um, find him in the depths of the internet world. Um, okay, so we don't have any questions, um, any any further questions as such at the moment. Um, we are, we do have now the vote available. Um, the poll is now reopened. So if you haven't voted, please do go and um, vote. Um, it is up and we will end it very shortly. Hopefully, once Sir Vince is back, we actually will require him because he's supposed to be giving a 10 minute view on, on the motion himself. So is he is he back in the room? Or have I just or can I, am I blind? Uh... No, I can't see him. OK. OK, hopefully he can get back. We have shut the breakout room, so he's he should he's arrive then. Oh dear. It's not one of the things you usually have in a rooster debate. Usually you're in the same room. So no there he is. There he is. So Vince, brilliant. Thank you for rejoining. Um, sorry for your loss in the internet realm. Um, we are actually now moving over to yourself, Sir Vince, to give a uh, up to 10 minutes your views on the motion. Um, are you happy just to, to speak? Yeah, just kick off. Yeah. Well, um... First of all, you know, thank you for inviting me. Um, as you mentioned I, I was an alumni. Um, in, I'm, 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 not, I'm quite long in the tooth, I think. And before, certainly in my day, you, you did, we didn't debate in the college. It's, it was in the union. And um, the debates in the college were in the college bar, usually quite well lubricated. 
um, <laughs> and not full structured in the way that you, you have today. Uh, so thank you for inviting me. And I think it was a really good event and very high standard. And, you know, we like, you know, I think all the judges like what, what happened. Um, probably, probably just, I don't know if it's at all helpful, but just how I might have approached this. Um, in, in a way, um, the, the proposition had a sort of inbuilt advantage because in a way it's self-evident that there are certain things that have to happen in a pandemic because it's contagious and also fatal. Uh, and there has to be an intervention. Um, there has to be collective action. Um, I think the way I would have developed it would be to have tried to identify the different ways in which you do need collective action and the extent to which almost all of them require government. And they're roughly as follows. Preparedness. And I thought Laura touched on that rather well, actually, about you know the, the role of the NHS and stock building. Um, education and uh, information and communicating the scientific consensus nobody really talked about that but quite an important function and otherwise uh, you know rumor dominates uh, the lockdown process preventing social interaction quarantining of boundaries something government's done very badly um, the test and trace concept doesn't have to be provided by the government but it does require government to coordinate it um, vaccine development, which um, I thought there was a, a very good intervention from Dan about that. Um, then vaccine distribution, uh, economic compensation, because lockdown is forced. And then economic stimulus, which probably could have been, it's about 10 things that have to happen. And all of them require the state uh, to intervene in some form. I think the opposition case was actually quite difficult to make, and but nonetheless, there were some good points made, um, partly about bad execution, and they're perfectly fair debating points, uh, partly about the, the, the fact that there are important roles for private actors like you know vaccine pharmaceutical companies. I think the three basic points I would have focused on would be to ask the question, uh, do you really need government uh, to carry out collective action. And I would have cited the experience of countries like Japan, which didn't have a lockdown because they weren't allowed to oh. under their constitution, and, and Sweden, which is a matter of choice, um, relied on people's sense of self-discipline and solidarity. So you, you can have social awareness without government um, mandation. And you know you can argue about whether or not it works, but that that is an alternative. I think a second line of argument, which I think several of the uh, two of the opposition speakers made well, is is the danger of state abuse. I mean, there's a whole spectrum of state intervention. I mean, nobody mentioned the dreaded word China, but actually, um, the biggest country in the world, the place it all started, but also the most effective action. Uh, in a country of 1.4 billion people stopped stopped uh, the, the epidemic with pretty brutal action. And uh, the question is, you know, in a democratic society, is that possible or desirable? Uh, but even in democratic France, uh, you know, you had to get a permit signed by the police yeah. or the mairie to, to leave your house for exercise, let alone um, uh, anymore. So there are questions about the degree of state power. But I think the, the fundamental argument, which is the heart of what the libertarians were saying, and I'm not a libertarian, but I mean, the, the more thoughtful ones were saying, do the costs outweigh the benefits? You know, clearly um, you're intervening to save lives, but, you know, being very brutal about it, the lives you're saving are mostly old codgers like me, uh, who probably have a fairly short life expectancy. Um, so we have to talk about the excess deaths, really. We're not immortal. Um, so there are some excess deaths, and that is a cost of letting the thing rip. Um, but the interventions have costs, uh, and the costs are very clear. They're enormous economic costs, and economic costs results in uh, diminished health. But we have the mental health problem. Uh, certainly one of the Conservative MPs, Charles Walker, has been making this point actually quite mm -hmm. eloquently about the mental health costs, mm -hmm. lockdown, restriction. Uh, and 
you know, the the effects on literacy. I thought one of the, I think it was the first Gabe who made the point about um, El Salvador and developing countries where the, the, you know, you're sacrificing a, a year of a child's education, uh, hunger, and, and India on a, an epic scale and some African countries. And you've saved very few lives because the population's quite youthful. So when you measure the costs against the benefits, it's not always clear that heavy state intervention to deal with a pandemic is the correct solution. So I think, you know, there is a, a libertarian case to be made. I, I think I'm probably not there myself, but I think you, you can make that. But but anyway, congratulations to the both sides, actually. I think most of those points came across in some form. And I thought it was a, a really very good and um, case I'm, and I'm delighted to you got me along to listen to it thanks thank you so much Vince and uh, thank you of course for attending this debate especially as a, a notable alumni of FITS I'm just gonna offer um, Sally or Richard do either of you would, would like to say a few words on the motion itself just before you um, you know obviously talk about the winners um, would either of you like to make I mean I'll just say something when I talk about the winners but very but literally a sentence yeah and yeah and Richard no? Okay, brilliant. Um, okay, well, we hopefully have now all voted. Mm -hmm. um, if you have all voted, that's brilliant. I'm going to end the poll now. Um, and I believe that the final vote from the audience uh, on the motion, this house believes the pandemic has demonstrated the positive role of state intervention. Those in favor were 17, those who opposed were 23, and those who abstained were three. So we've had a bit of a swing. Yeah. Um, so well done to the opposition. Um, for that amongst the floor debaters. Um, oh. So without further ado, we turn straight to the um, judging of the Brewster Prize and winners. Uh, shall I hand over to Sally as the- Yep, great. Thank judge. you very much. And well done, everybody. I thought it was, I thought it was genuinely really, really good, actually. And I think, and we all, we all felt that and we all enjoyed it. And I'm very glad you've recorded it, George, because if you think about it, there will be There'll be a heck of a lot of debates about the quality of the state intervention in the coming period, um, and it, this is this is a pretty good it's a pretty good base I think to 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 revisit in the future. So so I'm very glad um, you, rec you recorded it. And I thought it was I think we all did. We all thought it was thought provoking. We thought it was clear. We thought it was interesting. And and I think I mean I think the really interesting um, sort of element that you, that you all brought to it in different ways was it was about the quality of the intervention and the scrutiny of the intervention and that's you know that's 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 rather that's an insightful way of looking at it I think so we have we have thought hard um and we have chosen two equal prize winners but actually it was genuinely hard it, it genuinely was hard because um, you know it, it, we enjoyed we, we enjoyed everybody's interventions but the two winners are uh, as I say, they're equal. So although I'm, although I'm doing them in a particular order, they're, they're actually equal prize winners. But the first is Bertie. So congratulations, Bertie. And we thought that we thought that yours was you, you had a really effective use of the case, case study that we all ended up listening to. And we were saying sometimes those things really don't work and can be kind of rather ghastly to listen to. But actually, the way you did it was was really good and, and we were all we all really concentrated on it and also the effective use of one issue because when you're the second when you come second in a sense the big landscape had been done really well by Laura um, so to zone in on one issue and really use that to 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 demonstrate your argument um, we thought was very was, was very effective so so very well done there and the second winner is Dan um, and we thought actually it's really really hard to go last actually it's 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 particularly tricky um but we thought you were extremely fluent and clear that you re both rebutted well but also reminded reminded us of the shape of of the opposition's argument uh, and particularly focusing on the pandemic as a test case in a sense of, of, of state intervention was 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 sharp and and, and incisive i think um, and I love the phrase, I mean, I didn't necessarily agree with you, but I love the phrase, the potential of the state was unrealized. I thought that was, you know, I mean, you, you, you encapsulated your, the early arguments of the rest of your team extremely well. So many congratulations to both of you, but I say it, it genuinely was a hard choice because it was, it was a great debate to listen to. So thank you very much indeed. It was a very, it was actually a very enjoyable way to spend a Friday evening. So thank you. 
did either of the other judges want to say anything on the on the speakers or not? Or they're both happy with, with Sally's review? Excellent. Brilliant. And well done to all the speakers. Um, I know how daunting it is having done it twice myself and I, I got thrashed the first time and um, none of you seem to be thrashed in any way. You all did very well, exactly. especially on Zoom. I mean, yeah. um, to do it on Zoom with no points of information and the usual conduct of debates. I'm, I'm very proud that you all did very well and uh, yeah, your conduct was brilliant. Okay, so we now move to the floor winner. Uh, unfortunately, we I'll admit that the floor debate was uh, a little quieter this year, but of course, I think partly down to obviously us being on Zoom and um, the threat of sort of standing up on Zoom is a bit of an odd one. Um, but I will hand over to Dr. Matt Neal to um, just give us a, a bit, a quick sort of summary of who the winner is of the floor debate and speech. Thank you, George. Um, and, and thank you to everyone who's, who's spoken uh, at any stage of proceedings this evening. It, it really has been a very, very thought-provoking evening um, and everybody's spoken really well and interestingly. Um, so well done. Um, I have to say I share Dan's concern that a debate on this sort of motion can too easily become good result, good state. Bad result, bad state. Mm. Um, and for this reason, um, I felt that the floor speech given by Jamie Parker Ward was an especially important one. Jamie provided some historical context, and it's in historical context that we may hope to discern some patterns which then add texture to our understanding of a kind that I think is extremely vital. Uh, so many congratulations, Jamie, um, for that uh, illuminating floor speech. And well done to everybody uh, this evening's proceedings. Thank you so much for that, Matt. And well done again to Jamie and, of course, to all the uh, debate winners and also participants uh, tonight. You all did a great job and thank you to judges. Just finally, um, thank you, of course, everyone who's helped put Brewster together. Um, and of course, particularly the Societies Committee, they've done a great job in uh, working on this. Um, and, you know, it's been part of our sort of big expansion this year. Finally, I just want to obviously mention that we do have another final debate uh, for this term and my final debate as coach uh, president. Uh, and that's on Friday, the 12th of March. Uh, and that will be with Cambridge Student Minds uh, in collaboration with them. And it will be on This House Believes It Is Acceptable to Laugh About Mental Health. So that should be an interesting debate. Um, so please do come along to that in two weeks time. Thank you again to everyone, to the judges, um, and I hope that everyone has a good evening. Thank, Thank you, you all. George. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you.